Today, I'm going to be speaking on the question of why the Last Supper, breaking bread, communion seems to be missing in the Gospel of John. This is so important. Why is it missing in John? But a quick story first. Uh, Earlier this week, I was talking to uh, an old friend who's been a Christian for more than 70 years, been following God, reads the Bible every day. And he said, what did you preach on last Sunday? And I said, uh, I preached on breaking bread, I mean, communion. And uh, what did you say? Well, I shared four emotions that we should have as we are taking the bread. So the first is, as we take the bread, sadness, remembering Jesus' suffering, He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's sadness as we take in what he did for us. And then there's a clinging to Jesus, receiving life from the one we depend on, that he is the one who sustains us. We we live because of him. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then as we take the wine... I suggested that we could, we could be filled with joy, that we're now washed spotlessly clean. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And there's like a sweetness as we take the wine. It's like, this is a celebration that he has washed us clean. And then, finally, a hope an imaginably, unimaginably bright future for eternity, because Jesus said, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, eternity, feasting with Jesus. What a thing to think about. And as we take the cup, We are to be reminded this is just a foretaste. This is just a little sampler of something for eternity. So I shared those four emotions, and he said, yeah, that's good, except the second one. I've never heard that before. And I thought, you've never heard of that before, and you've read the Bible every day for 70 years? And as I thought about it, I realized that actually there are probably a lot of people who actually don't connect these things together because of the way that the Lord's Supper is presented in the gospel. So let's go back to the original question. How come that when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the Last Supper, Jesus Jesus breaks the bread, he shares the wine, he said, do this in remembrance of me. We look in John, the Last Supper, Jesus washes their feet, He does hand out some bread, but Judas takes some out and disappears. And then then we have several chapters of Jesus sharing his ministry and a final prayer. What's up, John? Like, isn't this so important you could have put it in there? So why is it missing from the Gospel of John? Well, the first thing is that John was written sometime after the others, a long time after the others, and he assumes you've read all the others. So John doesn't actually try and tell the story like Luke does. John misses out actually quite a few major things in the gospel. If you read it, you know, there's some really, really major things. Um, You know, look at the birth narrative. Well, where is that in John? You know, that kind of thing, because he assumes you know the story. I'm going to pick out some key things. So that's the first, first thing. But the second thing is more significant. Actually, There's another part in John, in John chapter 6, early on in Jesus' ministry, where we get some stuff that really, I'm going to argue, is actually about breaking of bread. And this is where I've quoted this from. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me um, uh, shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That is from John chapter 6. Not from the Last Supper, but I believe it's the same teaching that that John is recalling earlier because he wants to bring another aspect into this story. So so my goal today is to grasp what Jesus really means when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and how these strange sounding words 
uh, can be for you a deep source of life. And just to overview what I'm going to do, very, very brief recap in John, and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at Jesus' words, because this is the heart of what I'm saying today. I want Jesus to preach to you today, not me. So we're going to look at Jesus' words and focus on hearing him today. And then we're going to ask some practical questions. What does this look like? And challenge us to do the same. So uh, very briefly, um, Jesus in the Gospel of John at that time, we've seen him um, recognized by John the Baptist as the coming Messiah. And then we see um, a few other things happen, like the, the wedding, the, the water to wine at the wedding. Then we have Nicodemus coming to him, and Jesus says, you must be born from above. And this is the, the comes to him by night. And this is the, the Pharisee, male Pharisee, who's honorable, and he comes to Jesus by night, and we don't know what happens to him. And then like the completely opposite story, in the next chapter, you get a female woman, bit of a shady past, live, lives in Samaria, not, she's the opposite to being a Pharisee, and she comes to him by day, well actually he comes to her by day, and she receives the message. So it's like an opposite, it's turning, it's, it's turning it, things upside down for us and making us think. So that was uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 5, and moving into chapter 6, we have Jesus doing some miracles and particularly feeding the 5,000. And he, he feeds 5,000 from five little loaves and two little fishes, and he feeds these people. So what happens then? After that point, Jesus um, disappears. He goes off and goes across the sea, and they, they all want to find him. Where's this Jesus gone? Eventually, the next day, they find him, and this is where we pick the story up. And it's important to, to see this back up as the, the, the prelude to this teaching that Jesus is going to bring. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the solemn truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate all the loaves of bread you wanted. They got free food. That's why they're looking for him. Do not work for the food that disappears, but for the food that remains to eternal life, the food which the Son of Man will give you, for God the Father has put his seal of approval on him. And uh, then they respond. What must we do to accomplish the deeds that God requires? Jesus replied, this is the deed that God requires to believe in the one whom he sent. So this is really interesting because they're expecting, you know, the Ten Commandments or more commandments or whatever, and they're not expecting this. And this is, as we saw, this is the new covenant. The new covenant replaces the getting to heaven by law with getting to heaven with just believing, trusting Jesus. So they said to him, then what miraculous sign will you perform that we may see and believe it? See what they're angling for? They said, um, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're not giving up on wanting food, are they? They're after this free food thing. And, you know, Jesus says, you have to believe in me. And they say, well, to believe in you, we need a sign. What about giving us some food as a miracle? So they're, they're relentless in pursuing their free food. But Jesus, is not, Jesus isn't going to, to let them off with that. In fact, he's going to bring this really powerful teaching. Jesus told them, I tell you the solemn truth. It's not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but my Father is giving you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, sir, give us this bread. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to skip over a few verses um, because... Um, there's a lot of stuff that's actually very similar. Now, um, what's really interesting about way, the way this is laid out, and I've shown you in colors, and um, it's, um, you can't unfortunately see everything on the screen. Maybe I can make the slides smaller so you can, wrong way. 
Okay, let's see a little bit more. So, uh, I've talked many times in my sermons about the way Hebrew poetry works and how you have a symmetry. You start off with something A, and then you introduce that leads on to B, which leads to C, and eventually you get down to the central point, and then you work back answering the things you, that you were raised to start with. But it's not just Hebrew poetry that works like that. Often, just the way people would discourse would use this kind of way of speaking. And not just in Hebrew, but other ancient cultures used the same kind of way of structuring their writing or their addresses. And um, what John has done, he's reproduced for, for us this very, very beautiful, perfectly symmetrical speech that Jesus gives. And we're going to see how everything matches up. So he starts off, he starts by saying, I am the bread of life, and it ends by saying, the one who eats this bread will live forever. And then the next thing he says is, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they died. Get it? Like you're asking for food. What happened to them? They got supernatural food. But where are they now? They died. And this is going to lead on to the person who eats, at the bottom there, the person who eats me will live because of me. So he then says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I give, I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews who are hostile to Jesus began to argue with one another. How can this man give us his flesh to eat. Well, you can understand this is a bit of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Just to come out of the blue with no explanation. You know, if I, just, if I said to you, no, you people, you've got to eat my flesh in order to live. <laughs> what's, this, what's this guy saying? It's a bit weird here. And so there was a bit of a disconnect going on here, quite understandably. Um, and so Jesus says, and this is the central statement, which everything comes around. Jesus said to them, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. And then we go back through the line, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day for the, my flesh is true food my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood resides in me and I in him. A little bit more explanation, talking about residing. Um, just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so he came down from heaven at the top there, reflected his living father sent him. The person who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. So, uh, how do you think they responded to that? Can anybody tell me? Not well. Not well. Uh, um, so Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Then many of his disciples, when they heard these things, said, this is a difficult saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining about this, he said to them, does this cause you to be offended? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. Human nature is of no help. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had already known from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. So Jesus said, added, because of this, I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has allowed him to come. Then the last three verses. After this, many of his disciples quit following him and did not accompany him any longer. So Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the, are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied, did, did I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. 
Now he said this about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for Judas was one of the 12 who was going to betray him. So this is very curious. It's a strange passage, isn't it? And why would Jesus say this without explanation when it would cause so much confusion and cause people to leave him? So earlier on, Jesus said, um, if you ask of me, I will give you this living bread. So does that remind you of anything? Jesus saying something similar to someone else? What was that? The woman at the well. Just um, a few chapters earlier, two chapters earlier, he says to her something similar. I'm the living water. You drink from me, you know, ask me, I will give you living water. He doesn't actually say, I am the living water, but he says, I'll give you living water. And um, so, and she, and she accepts it and she is, she is saved. So what's going on here? Um, there's something that is, that, is, that is odd, and I'm going to try and unpack it today. Now, of course, we have the benefit of hindsight because we know what Jesus is talking about. But in the, at that moment, they were quite confused what he was saying. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, let's, let me try and um, distill what Jesus is saying now. Um, he says... People had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Um, and we ask, what is he talking about? Well, he, direct, he says, I think the clearest verse is verse 57. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who consumes me will live because of me. Now, when you... if if somebody was really paying attention to Jesus' teaching and listening to everything, they would actually hear lots of clues as to what he meant. So let me, let me ask you a question, see how good your memory is. When Jesus um, was talking to the woman at the well, after he, they, they got here, they got there, um, sorry, his disciples weren't there, they were off getting stuff. That when they arrived, then... They, um, they asked Jesus if he was hungry because they had some food. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said he wasn't hungry, and they said, well, they thought maybe he'd eaten somewhere else. What did Jesus say? Why wasn't he hungry? Yeah? You know? Sorry? That's not quite right, but you're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. He said, my food is to do the will of the Father. He said, that's my food. I'm not hungry because this, this is like, this is sustaining. This is my food to do this. It was so satisfying to do the Father's will. Like he's seeing somebody come into the kingdom. This is so exciting. He's not even hungry. And so, um, so this is... This is um, an, an idea that echoes through a number of places where Jesus says that doing the Father's will is what sustains him, like what keeps him going. It's he feeds off doing the Father's will. So uh, here we go. Let's look at the actual, what he actually said. He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples began to, to say to one another, no one brought him anything to eat. How did that? Did they? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. So that, I think, matches up with the, uh, the verse that we just looked at about um, um, Jesus' uh, relationship uh, with the Father being a pattern for us. And so, as I said, the verse is, just as the Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so the person who eats me will live because of me. So I'm going to try and sum this up in a picture now. And uh, this is my picture to try and put this message together. And uh, I'm going to... Um, let's see if this is going to work. There we go. Um, that Jesus is saying his relationship with the Father is a pattern for our relationship with him. And there's a two directions in this relationship that he is living a life of submission uh, to, to the Father... And, and 
He is depending on the Father to do that. So all of the miracles that Jesus did were actually done by the power that the Father gave him. He didn't rely on his own divinity to do them because he wanted to be a pattern for us. He wanted to demonstrate for us what somebody can do who's walking in the power of God. And so he's demonstrating this relationship, which is a two-way relationship. And if we get this... This is the key idea today I want us to get, that it's a two-way relationship we have with Jesus, that we are living moment by moment with the power that's flowing from him into us, and, he, and we are submitting to him. We are doing his will. Our food and drink is to do his will. And this is as we try and follow Jesus. So this is the image then. This is summing up what Jesus is saying in this passage. Um, what, how I live because of the Father, so you live because of me. And I want us to, I want to talk about how we walk this out in practice. And that's going to be the rest of the time that I speak to you today. How we walk this out in practice. So just a summary then. Jesus lived, lived every moment and breathed every breath to obey the will of the Father to do the Father's will with his, meat, his drink, his meat, it was everything to him. He didn't do anything in his own strength, but did everything by the power that flowed from the Father. And he's calling us to relate in the same way. This might seem like death, but it's actually the way to life. So let me come back to the question, why did Jesus teach this in such a weird and obscure way without explaining it? Like, why did he say something which turned to, made a lot of disciples turn away? Why would he do that? Well, um, I think that one of the problems Jesus faced was they thought they already understood everything about him. He was just like another teacher and so on. And he needed to shock them out of their mindset. He needed to say, no, you've got it wrong. You have me completely wrong. And there needed to be a radical shift. And he had to challenge them. Oh, you know, I don't actually understand this person at all. And, and um, I've got a story I'm going to, to uh, read you as, a, an, as an example of this to illustrate this about, about having completely the wrong mindset. So this is um, told by um, a magazine called a magazine of the Naval Institute called Proceedings. And um, a writer called Frank Koch re recounts the story of something that happened in the Navy. Two battleships assigned to the training squadron had been at sea on maneuvers in heavy weather for several days. I was serving on the lead battleship and was on watch in the bridge as night fell. The visibility was poor with patchy fog, so the captain remained on the bridge keeping an eye on all activities. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing of the bridge reported light bearing on starboard bow. Is it steady or moving astern? The captain called out. Lookout replied, steady, captain. That means they were in a dangerous course with the ship. The captain called out to the signalman. Signal that ship. We're on a collision course advise you to change course 20 degrees. Back came a signal, advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain said, send, I'm a captain, change course 20 degrees. I'm a seaman second class, came the reply, you'd better ch cor change course 20 degrees. By that time, the captain was furious. He spat out, send, I'm a battleship change course 20 degrees. Back came the flashing of signal. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> we changed course. <laughs> so what went on in your mind? In that last segment, you have to kind of reorganize your, your brain. It's not two ships, it's a ship and a lighthouse. And oh, there's a completely different story. And there's a shock in that. And sometimes we need something that's like shocking to take us out of a mindset into a different way of thinking. And I believe that Jesus had to do this. 
And really what he wanted them to do is to say, Jesus, I don't understand. You will have to explain this to me. And some of them did. You know, the disciples came up, not just the 12 people, came up and they asked him questions. And of course, they had the opportunity to do that. Jesus wanted them to do that. But he, and it was like a test. You know, if you're really serious about this, um, then you can, we can talk about it. If you're not, I don't even want you as a disciple. If you're only here for the food, then I don't want you following me just for that. Because, you know, then I, you won't be representing me when I send you out. So it's, a, it's like a sifting operation, but it's really trying to shock people into thinking, into, into understanding a new idea. And in a way, I want you to shock you today, because I want you to actually grasp something which is a little different to how we usually think. And I want to spend just a few moments on the image of eating. Um, food is survival, isn't it? So, you know, if you, don't, if you don't eat or drink, how long can you live for? I think three days without drinking, something like that. It's not for very long. You can live longer without eating, but food is survival. And um, perhaps the most powerful image that these words have in Jesus is that food sustains our lives. Food gives us sustenance. Food is something we all need moment by moment. We can't go on without it because it's vital for us. And I think what Jesus is teaching here, primarily, this is the primary teaching today, we need to depend on him utterly, moment by moment, in order to survive. Moment by moment, in order to survive. And uh, I... I, I think that we may think we're doing this. I want to challenge us in a moment is to some ways that we do or we don't do this. Um, Jesus uses this image of feeding on him, but using it in a slightly different way in another place in John. Does anybody know? Here's a clue where, where in John this idea is. I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, what do you need to do then? Abide. Abide, that's right. You need to be connected to me. What does a branch get from the vine? Anything? Yeah, everything. Yes, the sap comes up from the roots. If the branches, the vine is fed. That's how it can do the grapes. You cannot bring forth fruit unless you abide in me. So it's actually the same teaching that Jesus is giving in the vine and the branches. But um, I think that... Um, that this teaching is also present in breaking of bread, as I said last week, when we eat. And it's key. It's one of the key things. It's one of the four key things I gave you last week. And I think that John has not given it to us in the Last Supper. He's given it to us in Jesus' teaching much earlier in John chapter 6, because he wants to give us the context of that and, and make more of it. And we get a whole chapter basically focused on this idea. There are more verses that I didn't read to you, but they say basically the same thing. Jesus going backwards and forwards with them about, no, you've got to feed on me. If you don't feed on me, you won't survive. You can't bring forth fruit unless you feed on me. So I think that this is an, an essential idea that we are food and drink. So he is our food and drink. And um, so... The question I want to ask then, and I want to think about what this actually means in practice. What does it actually mean in practice? So one helpful thing is to see that Jesus said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have everlasting life. So what other things were there that Jesus said that we could do to gain everlasting life? I have four things in John's gospel that Jesus said, do this and you'll have, ever, have everlasting life. Anybody tell me? Yeah? Believe in Jesus. Yes, absolutely. Two more. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's look at them. Uh, obviously, eating and drinking Christ. Trusting and believing in Jesus. Coming to Christ, come to me, he says, and you have everlasting life. Come to me and obey my words and abide in them. So abide in my words and you have everlasting life. 
And that really means following him. Uh, the gospel talk about following Jesus, just following him. And I want to suggest to you, I'm going to give you a little image for this, um, uh, that these together are four aspects of the same thing. And if we want to understand what eating and drinking, his flesh and his blood are, they actually can't be that different to the other things if they're all actually what bring us eternal life. They almost have overlapping aspects. And so uh, eating and drinking, the first one I have there at the top is abiding, obeying his words. Well, this is interesting because Jesus said, if I do the will of the Father, he's my food. So as we're doing the will of Jesus, we're doing his stuff, then it is our food to do that. So um, eating and drinking and doing his will are connected together. Now, trusting, believing, of course, are really connected with that because you don't, unless you trust him, you're not going to do his will. Those are really one, two sides of the same coin. You trust it, you do it. Um, you know, if you said to somebody, uh, somebody said to me, you know, I really trust the TTC. I just, I just trust it so much. Well, how often do you use it? Well, I never actually use it. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. No, that doesn't make sense. No, because to trust it is to use it. And it's the same thing. If you really trust Jesus, then you follow his word. You do his stuff. And coming to him is like a visual of this. You come to him to receive life. You come to him in order to hear his words, to, to trust and to believe him. So those are different uh, parallel images that we have that help, help us unpack what is being meant here. And so... That, that's really my, my main summary. I want to just unpack a little bit more of ideas in practice. So we've, we've done a careful reading of John 6. I've asked what it means to eat and to drink, and now I want to, to have a challenge. And um, I want to suggest that this is a combination of trusting and depending. So... Um, uh, a few years ago, I made my first trip to New York City. And um, on the, I'd never been there before, and I knew I had to get from the airport to a certain location downtown, and it was uh, kind of scary. Didn't know anything about public transit. I thought I would get an Uber, but actually that just didn't work. Um, but the person I sat next to on the plane, we talked the whole time, and uh, I kind of, she'd been to New York a lot, and... Uh, she said, it's okay, I know where I'm going if you know, you can come with me and we can, we, I know we, we can get a bus and I can take you somewhere near. So I followed along. And so this is like, I'm following this person and I'm trusting this person. And they're really the same thing. I, I have no idea where I'm going in this city. And it's kind of a scary place. But if I stick near this person who knows where she's going, then trusting and following become the same thing. And I want to suggest that image to you today in this crazy world, that sticking close to Jesus, trusting him and following him, is kind of what this is saying, this is talking about now. Um, but um, and let me give you another story, and this is a very recent story from my own life, that um, in, in a few hours we're, we're flying to the UK, and we, we trust that everything will work out. And this last week has been absolutely crazy trying to get everything ready to go. Stuff, preparing today's stuff, the, for the, the IT stuff for the church, plus other work, plus getting the house ready, plus all the stuff the other end to do, plus packing. You know, there's no end, isn't there no end of stuff to be done? And, you know, as I was, I was planning to preach in this sermon, I was thinking, hey, maybe Jesus tells me I need, to, I need to feed on him in doing this. I just need to relax. Like, Jesus, you will give me, I'm doing your will here. Like, don't worry about that sermon on Sunday because I'm going to be there for you. You're preaching my word. I will be there. And I really felt that Jesus, and I've said before, he often does this. He decides to teach me a lesson as I'm coming up to preach a sermon on the topic of the sermon. And I really felt it this week. I had to constantly say, I'm trusting you, Jesus. I'm trusting this will work out. I'm trusting this will happen. Like yesterday, um, I needed to check in online. I'd got the information I needed. I'd stored it away somewhere and I couldn't find it. Jesus, thank you that you're with me now. 
Can you please help me find this? Oh, there it is. I found it. So many things. But also, there are times when there's a, there's a, 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 a Y in the road, and we, do we go this way or do we go this way? Well, what does, where would Jesus want me to go? So we were at a, a wedding reception yesterday, and we didn't want to stay too long because we've got so much to do. But the person I was sitting next to was um, n- not a believer, but actually, as we got talking, wanted to know all about church and, and really wanted to know about it and more and more stuff. And I was thinking, I'm, fe- I'm doing the will of the Father now. This is, I, you know, I'm doing the will of Jesus. I shouldn't be worrying about leaving this because this is what life is about. And so I just relaxed that I'm going to take all the time I need to tell this person about what it means, what our church is like, you know, what, what, um, what, you know, what, what God is like and so on. And because that's the choice I'm going to make, because that's the choice that I'm following Jesus. And you're going to have lots of little choices in your life. Some of them are really small, some of them are bigger choices. But Jesus should be involved in all of those choices. And, and you can't really separate trusting him, resting in him, feeding off him from making the choices. Because he will supply you with the, what you need when you're, when you're following him. So I want to suggest to you that you've probably got various stresses in this coming week. Anybody here got a totally stress-free week? Nothing to worry about? No, no, there's some laughter here. No, like there's all sorts of things coming up. And I want you to practice this week to, to, to have this almost like a continual prayer in the back of your mind, almost a continual thing. Jesus, you're with me. I thank you. I thank you. You're with me. I'm feeding off you right now. He wants you to, to be sustained by him spiritually and emotionally, exactly as by food and drink you're sustained physically. Isn't that powerful? That's what he wants. He wants your, you, you, your emotions and your, and your stresses and your, and your choices to be sustained by him in this way. And so this is the thing I want, to take, I want you to take home. And I'm going to get asked Dan to come up now. And this is the thing I want you to take home and I want you to take with you in this coming week. I want you to practice eating, drinking, depending on Jesus moment by moment this coming week. I want you to just check in with him moment by moment. And I believe that this is an integral part of what we do when we break bread together. But in a sense, John taught it in a scenario that was a life scenario not just a breaking bread last supper scenario, because he wanted us to practice this, not just when we're celebrating breaking bread, but he wanted this to be like a whole life thing. Because Jesus taught it in John 6 for all time, not just while you're doing this. He weren't actually having a meal at that time in John 6. He was just telling them this. So um, uh, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christ follower today, then this is exactly the message you need to hear as well. This is a message about what it means to have eternal life, a message what it means to be a Christ follower. I prefer the word Christ follower than Christian because Christian has been so devalued today. To become a Christ follower, all you need to do is to feed on him by making the choice that you, those fourth quadrant, that you come to him just by prayer, just asking him, you trust him, you believe him, and you live your life wanting to do his will. And that is how you will receive eternal life. Believing on me, Jesus said, you'll receive eternal life. So I want to close by reading uh, four verses here from John chapter 6. And I want us to, as I read them, I want you just to take them into your heart. Uh, Jesus said to them, I tell you, the solemn truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh 
and drinks my blood resides in me and I in him. To have Jesus residing in me is the most wonderful thing I can imagine. What do I have to fear in the universe if Jesus is residing in me? So this is what I want you to take away with you now. Jesus is residing in you. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to him. A constant background prayer. I depend on you. I cannot live without you, Jesus. Be with me right now because I want to abide in you. Acknowledge your need and he will come. So let's just bring this to him. And I just want you to to, um, make this your prayer as well. Jesus, we thank you for these words. We thank you for this extraordinary offer that you make to abide in us, to be our food and drink, to be our sustenance. We ask you, Lord, now, not to let this idea pop out of our minds once we leave this place, but may it stay in us. Help us, Lord, to make this our daily, hourly, moment-by-moment practice to recognize you within us and to consciously depend on you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.